Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, new information on the fire that in 2020 engulfed a Navy vessel. A recent report sheds light on what happened. Plus, the Marine Corps loosens its strict tattoo policy. Find out where grunts can expand their ink collection. And big dollars on the contract for future fighter jets' as engines. Find out who won the bid. And an inside look at the Air Force's latest electronic warfare aircraft and an effort by the Army to expand its AI capabilities. It's the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon. This is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. As always, there's a lot happening around the military and defense spaces, so let's dig in. First up, after the amphibious assault ship Bonhomme Richard burned at the docks for nearly a week in 2020, the entire ship was eventually lost. Now the Navy has released a review that raises questions about why the fire wasn't prevented. Navy Times' Jeff Zizulowitz brings us more. For more than a year, what caused the fire to break out aboard the amphibious assault ship Bonham Richard in July 2020 has remained a mystery. But in recent weeks, Big Navy released its command investigation into the disaster, a nearly week-long fire that eventually sent the flat top to the scrap heap. That command investigation found a raft of failures both among the ship's crew and ashore at Naval Base San Diego. Sailors on board were undertrained to fight a shipyard fire, and the Bonnie Dix fire suppression systems were not properly maintained. Ashore, confusion abounded, and the base's firefighting department proved unable to effectively coordinate the fire response with the ship's crew. The investigation also found that random choices cascaded this disaster. After the crew had evacuated the ship in the early hours of the blaze, the command duty officer cut power to the ship because he believed they were dealing with an electrical fire. But this in turn cut the juice to the ship's fire suppression systems and the blaze was allowed to spread throughout the amphib. The Navy charged Seaman recruit Ryan Sawyer Mays with intentionally starting the fire on the Bonham Richard earlier this year. An Article 32 hearing will be held in late November to decide whether the charges will ultimately be taken to court martial. So while an allegedly disgruntled junior sailor is accused of starting the blaze aboard the Bonham Richard, the investigation found that a host of systemic failures across many Navy echelons ultimately killed the ship. To learn a bit more about the Bonham Richard fire and systemic failings that led to the Amphib's demise, we're joined by Larry Brennan. He's a retired Navy captain and a professor of law at the Fordham University School of Law. He was also part of the investigative team that dived into the 1981 fire on the uh, deck of the aircraft carrier Nimitz. Larry, thanks for joining us. Appreciate being invited, Jeff. Good to talk to you. So we had the command investigation released in recent weeks, as well as this major fires review that looked at a variety of shipboard fires over the past 12 years or so. What do these documents say to you about the state of maintenance in Navy shipyards today? Being in a shipyard always is a difficult risk for a vessel and the people responsible for the vessel in the shipyard, uh, whether it's alongside pier, as in the case of Bonham Richard, or in a graving dock, dry dock, or being constructed. We can go through decades of history and it's a problem. Uh, one of the difficulties is what are the available sources to fight a fire? What are the available personnel? Uh, one of the tragic inexplicable problems here is the shoreside fire department nozzles and, and hoses didn't easily connect with the fixtures on board ship. Uh, 
inexplicable. No reason that that happens. And that's not the CEO's fault. That's not the fire marshal's fault on board Bonham Richard. It, it's a systemic problem. And that's where we have to look. And I think we need a deep probe into systemic issues as opposed to just personal accountability. We've had too many problems too often. Uh, and we look and look at the same, same thing. We need to see what we, we have and what we need to add to it, whether it's people, machinery, sensors, remote activated things, it, it's complex. We do a great job at fighting fire at sea. We don't do a good job at preventing and fighting fire in, in the yard. You know, this is not the first time in recent memory where uh, the US Navy has lost a capital vessel in this kind of needless shipyard environment, a peacetime environment to lose this asset is, is so unthinkable for so many. You go back to the submarine USS Miami in 2012, which also, you know, fatally burned to a point where they, you know, the Navy had to scrap that vessel as well. There was a raft of reforms put in place after that disaster. You know, wh why do you think reforms after such a similar disaster weren't cemented? Because we don't have an implementing system of priority. We're a war fighting community and we're really good at fighting war. I think we're really good at fighting fires at sea on flight decks and in other spaces and engine rooms. We've built lots of systems and they're highly remote, highly technical, and they're torn apart in the shipyard. We need a czar of some sort, if that's an appropriate word, but we need a leader to be responsible for understanding, managing, studying, implementing and following up on the shipyard, ships in the shipyard issues. Can you paint a picture for our viewers of what the interior of a ship like the Bonnie Dick uh, looks like when it's in the yards in terms of just the, the junk and the crap everywhere, the cables? Can you kind of give our viewers a, a sense of what that, what that environment is like? Two things. One, your question is important because we have to understand that ships are designed essentially like uh, checkerboards or uh, or a uh, crossword puzzle horizontally and vertically and each compartment is designed a to be able to control and respond to a fire so you can button up the ship that's not true in the case of the LHDs uh, like Bonham Richard with the uh, the well deck and the V and the area where the arsonist apparently started the fire according to that investigation uh, what a ship in a shipyard like especially for a long time is like my room when I was a kid. Uh, it's just a bunch of mess. And, and the reports in this case, long, you know, long before this week were that it was a series of fire hazards that should not and cannot have been accepted. Part of the shock of the Bonham Richard fire for anybody watching was its inconceivability. How could a modern American warship burn so furiously for days while in port during peacetime? In addition to the Bonham Richard command investigation, the Navy released a so-called major fires review that took a more historical approach and looked at a series of shipboard fires over the past decade or so. That major fires review found many of the same issues that plagued the Bonnie Dick. Undertrained skeleton crews in the yards, inadequate shipyard infrastructure, and shore-based fire departments unprepared for such a conflagration. The Navy is now promising a series of reforms to prevent another Bonham Richard type disaster. We'll be following them to see where those reforms lead. Thanks, Jeff. And in other military news, the Navy has confirmed that a submarine damaged in a collision in the South China Sea in October struck an underwater mountain. Officials have not yet revealed the extent of the destruction to the nuclear-powered submarine Connecticut or any further details. The accident caused a number of minor injuries, but the strike did not harm the ship's nuclear reactor or propulsion system. And an Air Force B-1B strategic bomber and U.S. allies flew over key Middle East checkpoints on Saturday amid ongoing tensions with Iran. The B-1B Lancer flew over the Strait of Hormuz, the Red Sea, and the Suez Canal. Fighter jets from Bahrain, Egypt, Israel, and Saudi Arabia flew alongside the bomber. Finally, in the Marine Corps, if there's anything Marines might want more than a bunch of tattoos, it might be more tattoos. The Marine Corps launched its new tattoo policy, which once again allows full arm ink. 
is also not rank specific, so anybody can have a sleeve. Marine officials said the policy was changed to help with retention. The old rules ended some careers. Between June 2015 and June 2016, 33 Marines were denied reenlistments because of their body art. The Corps is encouraging Marines affected by the old policy to try to reenlist. We wanted to hear your opinions, so we set up a phone number for Anonymous Insights. Here's what some of our viewers had to say. They are unprofessional and they're downright scary. It, it is a little bit too late because the Marine Corps lost a lot of combat experience and they took a lot of that combat experience with them when they joined the Army. I have no idea why they want to allow Marines to look like traveling scoreboards. I think it's great that the Marine Corps is doing it. It's about time. Go Marine Corps, I'm very proud. I was always happy that I didn't get so drunk that I got a tattoo. I'm a sexual assault survivor. I care more about what we're doing to help other sexual assault survivors. I couldn't care less about visible tattoos in the military. As someone who is tattooed, for the record. Tattoos are a part of the Marine Corps, going way back to the beginning. Take care, Semper Fi. Bye. Those are the military headlines from this week. When we come back, a look at the Air Force's new electronic warfare aircraft and the latest moves in defense contracting. The U.S. Air Force has used a C-130 for its electronic warfare compass call, which jams enemy signals. It's now moving from a legacy military plane to a business jet. Defense News' air warfare reporter Stephen Losey has been covering the transition and joined us to tell us more. Steve, welcome to the show. Good to be here. You've been reporting on the Air Force's electronic warfare plane. There's a big change. What's your reporting showing? The Air Force has been flying the EC-130 Compass Call in the Middle East for the last 20 years. They're now coming home with the end of the war in Afghanistan. But a lot of those airframes, based on the C-130, are very old, dating back to the Vietnam era in some cases. And so the Air Force realized they need to do an upgrade and uh, get some of that electronic warfare capability in a new, fresh airframe. So they're going from something big, the C-130, to something small, the uh, business jet, the Gulfstream. That's right. The uh, Gulfstream G-550 is going to be the EC-37B compass call, the next generation of compass calls. And right now, L3 Harris is working on modifying the first uh, G-550 to be ready to accept some of the uh, electronics from the old compass call. They're moving from a big plane to a small plane. Are the capabilities of, are the electronic warfare capabilities going to change at all? No, the, in some, many cases, some of the uh, original equipment from the old EC-130 is going to be basically done, they're going to do an organ transplant and put the old equipment in the new plane. Now they've been heavily modifying the G550 Gulfstream jet to be able to accept this. That includes enlarging the nose, enlarging the tail, adding um, extra uh, extra room in the side panels to be able to accept the uh, the radomes, the antennas, and some of the uh, other electronics. Um, now they're also in some cases putting some updated electronics in that um, do similar things to the old equipment, but use up-to-date um, technology, in some cases that's been um, smaller, miniature, miniaturized, to, um, to fit that in the, uh, the G550. It's interesting that the Air Force is going from a legacy aircraft to a business aircraft, but it looks like there's a lot of benefits on the maintenance side. That's right. L3 Harris says that the C-130, because it's a military plane, sometimes requires depot maintenance, requires some specialized parts, um, but the, uh, the G550, because it's a commercial jet, some of these parts are more readily available and won't require as much time in the depots, won't require as much time out of commission while it's getting repaired. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you. An engine contract, a unique customer for an American tanker, and a binational agreement to power a tank. All that in this week's industry headlines. General Electric just secured a contract with the U.S. Air Force to be the sole provider of engines for the F-15 EX Eagle II. The contract is worth more than $1.5 billion and calls for GE to supply the service with 29 engines. That'll fill 12 of the Boeing jets. Those engines include installs and spares. 
GE could eventually provide 329 engines in all for 136 aircraft. The last of those engines would be delivered in 2031. Japan will be the first non-American operator of the KC-46A tanker. Boeing has delivered the first of four KC-46A tankers to the Japanese government, and that's the first delivery of the aircraft to a customer outside of the United States. The aircraft departed Boeing's facility in Seattle on October 28th with the call sign REACH-46 and arrived at Miho Air Base in Japan the next day. The president of Boeing's Japan said that the aircraft will play a critical role in security for both countries. He added that it will also support Japan's humanitarian relief efforts because it carries cargo and passengers. Turkey and South Korea have signed a letter of intent to cooperate on the Turkish Altai tank. The October 22nd deal states that two Korean companies will supply engines and transmissions for Turkey's indigenous vehicle. Turkey, Turkish manufacturer BMC makes the Altai and has been negotiating the agreement with Korea's Doosan and SNT Dynamics. The companies will supply the engine and the transmission for the tank. Turkey had originally hoped to power the Altai tank with German MTU engine and ring transmissions, but those plans fell through. Are you into cybersecurity? If so, make sure to sign up for the C4ISR Net CyberCon. Here to speak about the November 10th virtual event is executive editor Mike Gruss. CyberCon is our annual military cyber conference. Uh, this year it's going to be held virtually on November 10th. Uh, we have three keynotes we're really excited about. Uh, one is Lieutenant General Charles Moore. He's the Deputy Commander at U.S. Cyber Command. We also have Mickey Yang. She's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber Policy. And we also have Dave McCown from the Department of Defense CIO's office, Chief Information Officer's office, and he's uh, the official there who oversees cybersecurity. And so the three of them will give a, a, a really great perspective on the state of cybersecurity in 2021 and going into 2022, and obviously from three different uh, perspectives. Uh, General Moore will probably focus on the operational perspective. Uh, uh, Mickey Yang will talk about some of the policies that are necessary uh, to improve cybersecurity and to improve cyber operations. I think we've, we've heard a lot the last year or so that uh, generals have said, hey, they have the authorities they need, but I think what we're going to be asking about is what else is necessary for that, for really effective cyber operations and effective cybersecurity. And then Mr. McCown will be talking about um, cybersecurity from a IT perspective. Obviously, the Department of Defense is one of those networks that uh, bad guys around the world really want to get in. And so he'll be talking about the steps that are necessary to keep those networks protected. This year's event is going to be November 10th. For folks who are interested in registering, you can go to cybercon.c4isrnet.com. Thank you, Mike. When we come back, tips for veteran entrepreneurs. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives tips for navigating entrepreneurship as a veteran. Unmistakably, employment is the number one concern for most transitioning veterans. And according to FinancialPoise.com, nearly one in four military spouses are unemployed. But entrepreneurship can change the game for military families. It's a way to create an income using the hard-earned skills unique to vets. Vetrepreneurs are the new veteran business owners, and non-traditional businesses are the new model. So maybe it's time to transition to a new mission, business ownership. Vets are literally cut out for this. It takes tenacity, grit, discipline, and a tireless work ethic. Sound familiar? Keep an open mind. Non-traditional ventures are breaking the mold these days. Go for portability and versatility, something that won't require an office space like photography, multimedia production, or web design. The virtual possibilities are endless. And there's always the option of becoming a franchisee. Vets have a leg up in following the strict plans and guidelines of a franchise business. Whatever your venture, as a vet, you may be better able to get loans and guidance from credit unions, banks, or specialty lenders. You can also take advantage advantage of investment programs run by other vets. And don't forget to check SBA.org for more resources. Your dedication and sense of purpose can be the start of a successful business and your next mission in life. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time.
To get more military and defense coverage daily, be sure to check out our stories at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And subscribe to our Early Bird Brief to join the list of military community members getting our headlines first thing every morning. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we come back, new AI efforts by the Army. And the famous Iron Dome comes to American forces. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The Army is looking to improve its live fire capability with the help of artificial intelligence. New exercises are expanding the frontier of machine learning for units in the field. And Todd South brings us an update on those efforts. So the Army's trying to find a new way to fight, and that's multi-domain operations. But to make multi-domain operations work, they have to have artificial intelligence, they have to have data collection, they have to connect all of these existing sensors, platforms, and shooters to even the future ones that are going to be built in years, years from now. And part of that is project convergence. Project convergence is essentially putting all that together, converging those assets to make them work, make them shoot what the Army wants, when it wants, where it wants, and how it wants. But that's a few years away. They're still developing that slowly, incrementally, um, maybe by 2028, 20, 2035 perhaps, they'll have that kind of fully integrated and to full fruition. But right now, a program called Scarlet Dragon is looking at a piece of that puzzle. Essentially, the 18th Airborne Corps, the unit that pretty much handles all the Army's airborne assets, think the 82nd Airborne Division or the 101st Airborne Division, they're at the, kind of the tip of the spear with this. They are the global response force, so they have to be in theater within a matter of hours or days. And they're trying to get those tools into the hands of those paratroopers, so should they come on ground in theater, they can use them effectively. And to do that, Scarlet Dragon is essentially linking up the Army with the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force, and all their different assets. And they've had you know, three test fires up until recently. They had their fourth test fire in October. That included all those assets I just mentioned off the east coast of the United States at Fort Bragg and also in Nevada. So they went across, you know, across the continent of the United States to make that happen. Eventually it'll be in theater in paratroopers' hands when they have to deploy one day. Right now the testing though is going through those different paces, figuring out how to make those systems talk to each other, make machines talk to machines, make those things work rapidly to get the data they need, when they want it, where they want it, so they can shoot what they need to. And they're gonna need a system like that to fight peer competitors in the future. I'm Todd South with Military Times. Thanks, Todd. And finally this week, the U.S. is looking to field its own version of the Israeli Iron Dome missile defense system. At the Association of the U.S. Army Conference recently, the president of the company working on that system for U.S. forces talked about updates to the program. I would like first to say that Iron Dome for us is much more than a program or a business. Yeah. We always uh, remember uh, the contribution and the support of the U.S people, the U.S. taxpayers, the governments during the years with, uh, with uh, budgets that were allowed the Israeli government to buy the system from us. We developed the system to protect the Israeli population and by the way not only the Israeli but the Palestinian as well mm -hmm. and we think that uh, with the success rate we are presenting a great uh, uh, system that uh, does exactly what uh, we were uh, tasked for. Yes. And it's ongoing program that uh, is uh, almost every year challenged by our counterparts around us. It's a highly and, proven and system. It is, it <laughs> is, it is. So we were very proud when uh, the U.S. Army decided to acquire uh, the systems. And uh, I understand that they are ready for the deployment. And the deployment that, as you mentioned, to Guam mm -hmm. is a good... Uh, give back for us on the on the on the, all the good that you did for us mm -hmm. uh, during the years so this is great news for us in uh, in the US we believe that uh, the iron dome with the support of raytheon uh, will stay as much as the army will decide that they need them mm -hmm. and we are stand by for any changes or any uh, uh, any requirements and uh, between us this is only you and me uh, we hope that other services will, uh, and we know that other services are paying attention to this technology for their needs, and we are at their service for the future. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on MilitaryTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for more coverage.
Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.